I'm an ecologist. And ecologists study living things in their context. And they have certain characteristics in the way that they look at the world. Have you noticed the way that ecologists are so doomy and gloomy? I mean, they're such a pessimistic bunch. And the reason is that they're always saying we're going to run out of things. Economists know better. That is to say, economists say you never run out of anything, it just gets more expensive. So ecologists are busy collapsing the resource base, whereas economists keep on cycling and cycling through episodes. Now, sometimes you actually do run out of stuff. <laughs> this is the Aral Sea, and they did run out of water. But in general terms, there's some sort of a substitution goes on. Copper gets more and more expensive, impractically so, and so we shift to silicon. Most of the world is made of silicon, so there's lots and lots of it. We're not going to run out or even have it as being scarce. The same thing happens in biology, but biologists don't recognize it as a substitution. Willows are plants that use wind pollination, and we can see that on the one side. On the other hand, there have been evolutionary pressures that have changed the pressure and moved willows into, back into wind pollination. And at that point, they have to reinvent petals, and they do this with their bright yellow stamens. So it's simply a substitution, but biologists don't see it that way. Economists, in general terms, view things as profit. And I, I, this isn't an apology here for business or the market or whatever else. Just profit as a concept. They use it a lot. Despite the fact that ecologists are talking about resources being used, they never talk about profit. I don't know why, but they never do. Now, I want to tell you a story about my lab and how it works. Before I retired, I used to have my graduate students come out to intellectual mud wrestling matches, sometimes at my, sometimes at my uh, home, but other times at my lab. It's the same group of people there, and you can see we're eating in both cases. I would go down to the Plants and Man lab where there was a stove, and I would cook lunch for about 20, 30 people. Um, we can see then that the resource comes from my garden. And the students go out and gather it. And you can see they're gathering uh, tomatoes. And enormous quantities of tomatoes is, is the deal. So tomatoes are abundant, and we waste them. That is to say, we only pick ripe tomatoes, uh, perfectly ripe, and anything else we just let rot. We don't process them in any way. We just consume them and eat the tomatoes. This is a resource that gives you a lot of gain for minimal effort. We call them high gain. High gain systems are wasteful. They're local because they sit on the hot spot of the resource. They're ephemeral because the hot spot doesn't last very long. And they're dynamical. You can describe them in terms of the dynamics of the situation. So the students go out there and they high gain the tomatoes. And then I high gain in the kitchen as I stick them in bags and we freeze them uh, for the rest of the year. Now, with tomatoes, you need basil, and I grow a lot of basil in my garden. But notice the way that whereas tomatoes are all tomatoes all the way, basil consists of leaves, which you want, and then stalks and stems and flowers and things that you don't. So we have to approach basil quite differently. We have to treat it as a low-quality resource. It's low gain. That is to say, you put in a lot of effort. You tend to be prudent. The resource is consumed in a dispersed way. The resource tends to be long-lasting and structural. And so that in this way, basil is reduced down, processed, increased in quality until we just have the leaves. So the students are out there in the garden, and they're low-gaining my basil. They're spending a lot of time just getting the good bits. 
And then the good bits come into me as a high quality resource and I proceed to high gain the, uh, the basil as I consume it. And in this way, we have plenty of resource for the food. Um, <clears throat> I have a good colleague, Joe Tainter. Uh, he's written a wonderful book in 1988 called The Collapse of Complex Societies. And his basic premise is that societies are problem-solving units and they solve problems by complexifying. In the beginning, you don't get a lot of benefit for complexification, then you get a lot, but in the end, there's a diminishing return on effort. So over time, we consume a resource, it collapses, becomes too expensive, we then indulge in some sort of a substitution. Notice, though, that the cost over time keeps on going up. Relative complicatedness is a different matter. Notice the way that we get more and more complicated and difficult to deal with, but then all of a sudden you change your strategy. Notice the way that you can only go so far with an abacus. You move around the little beads and that's all well and good, but you can't get very far with that. I mean, the Incas did well, but they were limited. But most of us these days work with computers. And notice the way then that while computers are intrinsically much more complicated, they're actually much easier to use. Um, and so we substitute and with the substitution, the world becomes easy to deal with. The Sumerians, for example, were able to increase their productivity in agriculture up to about 26 point something or other for uh, the barley per, per hectare. Um, that's a lot. That's about what you get in Wisconsin. So there they are driving their way up this agricultural curve until eventually they say, well, what can we do? We need more. What can we do? And they switch to rape, loot, and pillage. Notice that all the difficult problems go away. The issue is not how can we increase and urge a little bit more production. The issue is, how do we get this stuff home? <laughs> and so in this way, it becomes easier. Society then moves from an agrarian system to an agrarian military system, and then in this way, increased complexity. Now let's proceed to look at animals in equivalent terms. These are harvester ants, and harvester ants are harvesting seeds. Harvester ants eat food. You're thinking, as opposed to what? <laughs> well, not all ants <laughs> gather food as a resource. Some ants gather, and I feel terribly intrusive about this picture. I mean, watching this poor grasshopper defecating. But there we go. <laughs> it's producing feces. You don't get a lot of feces because you have the sun and then leaves. It feeds the grasshopper that produces the feces. So there's not a whole lot of resource there. Now you might think feces, well that's a low quality resource. Not if you're raising fungi, it's jet fuel, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> and so in this way, they gather the resource, have special strains of fungi, and the fungi then um, uh, generate fungal biomass, which these ants then proceed to eat. So these guys are making basil, they're not making tomatoes. <laughs> the harvester ants are making tomatoes. Now, <clears throat> notice that we don't have a whole lot of grasshopper feces, and that limits the size. Their area is about as big as the thing I'm standing on. That's all they work with. Alternatively, if you move to sun, to leaves, and then harvest the leaves, then there's an enormous quantity of leaves. But you know what? Leaves aren't very good for raising fungi. And in fact, the fungi which exploit the leaves in the nest are seven times more efficient. Very highly specified particular strains. And these are really impressive uh, ants. They have great big millions and millions of members. They have soldier ants, which are 300 times the size of minim ants and various other different sorts of ant in the colony in between. They have roads, which are sometimes as long as 300 yards. I mean, that's a lot. And they even have casts which go in for street cleaning. I mean, we're talking really elaborate. 
This is massive low gain. They're consuming such huge quantities they can even become agricultural pests. And so, grass, uh, so grasshopper feces is all well and good, but leaves let you get even bigger and better. Now, another colonial insect are termites, a completely separate group, deriving from cockroaches. And these can be plotted on a space here. And we can, first of all, the red ball are termites that live in wood. They live in wood, they eat the wood, and eventually their catastrophe is they literally eat themselves out of house and home. They eat their homes. At that point, they go over the high gain collapse, and then in this way have to reboot and move to a new colonial situation. Well, that's all well and good, but there is another approach. One of them is, whoa! <laughs> As you get to the edge, you're looking over saying, oh my god, what can we do? Let's go this way. <laughs> and so that in this way, by changing course, they move towards the prudent consumption line. Remarkably enough, hardly any systems go prudent. Notice they haven't followed the top half of the prudent line. And systems don't do that. As long as there is a high gain resource in the vicinity, they will use it. All systems do that. All systems are wasteful. For example, you'd think in these times of expensive and difficult fuel, you'd reckon we'd conserve gas. If you take a picture of the United States, out in Minnesota and South Dakota, you can see a glow. And that glow is just gas being blown off and wasted. We never look after our resource. But once you've got to this prudent use, then all of a sudden, Instead of living in your food, you live in an area where you move out to get the food and bring it back in again. Dead twigs, little branches, and so forth. It's a low-gain system, so there's lots of resource. There's so much resource that 10% of the methane in our atmosphere comes from those guys. I mean, it's impressive. They're really big and low-gain. You know what's really exciting? It doesn't stop there. <laughs> there's 40% goodness in dead wood that you gather. There's still 5% goodness in soil. 65% of termite species, not biomass, but species, 65% of termite species eat soil. Whoa. <laughs> it's not much resource there. But if you're clever and work hard enough and are low gain enough, you can still uh, get by on soil. Now, if you're a termite, you're sort of limited by the way that uh, termites are termites, and there's only so much soil you can eat. Other organisms that live in soil actually represent most of the biomass on the planet. Bacteria are really good at living in soil, and they live in this huge mass of renewable resource, as far as they're concerned. So that in this way, they never run out, and form this absolute mass of material. Human societies do the same thing. Joe Tainter and I recently wrote a paper where we looked at the thermodynamics of ants as opposed to the Roman Empire. I've already talked to you about, uh, I've already talked to you about uh, the Roman roads, which Atta ants use. Well, we ran this same comparison. Here is Caesar in the Roman Republic. He used to rape, loot, and pillage. There's a trouble with rape, loot, and pillage. You can only do it once. <laughs> the trouble is, when you've raped and looted and pillaged, there's nothing left. And so that in this way, the Roman Republic did wonderfully well. They had a fund for orphans and widows. But in the end, they had to move to an empire. This is his nephew, Augustus. And Augustus is really low gaining. He moves away from taking gold there's a lot of gold out there if you can get it, but eventually it runs out. So you have to move to peasants. There's not much in a peasant, but there's lots of them. <laughs> so you go out and you tax them. The taxation system in the Roman Empire was really, really impressive. In the end, the Western Empire collapses, the Eastern Empire takes over, but it too begins to run into becoming too complex, 
with too big an overhead, they're running short of materials. Constans II, the emperor before him in the east, was, uh, was Maurice, and he was killed by his soldiers because he halved their wages. So being an emperor wasn't that good a deal. <laughs> So Constans was very clever, and he's the only example we know of, the only one that actually actively simplified. In this way, then, he gave away a fifth of the empire and gave it to his soldiers. It was such a good deal that a revolting army killed their general in North Africa and came back into the system to get in on the deal. It works wonderfully well. Instead of sun making grain that's then turned into gold and silver, which is consumed by the soldiers. The soldiers make the resource. Instead of being a burden on society, they're suddenly a wonderful asset to society. They're the only system that we know that we can think of that actually, actually actively simplified. We have to do the same. Now, we've moved from the Industrial Revolution, where the strategy was double the size of the engine, thicken the cable, and pull harder. <laughs> if the span is wider, just make a bigger bridge. Industrial systems were large, but not the systems we work with today. The systems we work with today get smaller and smaller. That's why rototillers and motor cars get more expensive and computers get cheaper, <laughs> because there's an economy of size. Increased speed, but an economy of size. Now, <clears throat> can we... Uh, survive the difficulties we're under now. A lot of people in society are pretty angry about this in this election, on the left and the right. And so we're getting pressured, so what can we do? Well, the Romans knew about coal, and they knew about steam engines. But they killed the guy who invented the steam engine and did so because it was going to undermine the slave economy. They had an industrial option, but they wouldn't go in that direction. So here we are. We have a very complicated society. The burden is absolutely huge. What we have to do is only things which are economical and worthwhile. Elon Musk is basically using oversized Victorian steam engines. You can't take the train to Mars, even if the train is going 20,000 miles an hour. There are physical limits. Millions of miles are things we simply can't handle. And so we have to not make the mistake of the Romans, but go with our future, which involves getting simpler and more efficient, and eventually, we hope, getting into some sort of new pattern. But it will be fundamentally different. Thank you for your attention.